It might be that time again. No, no, not that time. Not that time again. No, no, just, it's one of those rambly videos. Uh, what you call it, uh, uh, filler content. Yeah, there we go. Hope everybody's home safe, you know, not getting infected with the thing. The computing industry, <laughs> despite some setbacks, is actually getting kind of interesting. AMD just announced Ryzen 3 parts, which I plan to get and take a look at and see what's going on with those. I thought we could touch base on not just Ryzen 3, but uh, you know, maybe that was a catalyst for creating this because it's worth mentioning and talking about that for a second. But sort of catching up on what's going on in the industry, at least from my perspective, on mobile, desktop, and workstations, and maybe we'll touch on servers a little bit, with Intel and AMD, but also, you know, there's a lot of third-party players here that are, that are kind of lurking in the background, and they could really come to the forefront, you know, manufacturing concerns and, you know, global situation concerns aside, and they could really come to the forefront in kind of a quick way. In a lot of ways, AMD has actually helped out the situation on the server side in terms of how easy it will be for somebody else to come along and do stuff. And I'll talk about that more in a second, but let's start with the Ryzen 3 announcements. Let's start with desktop. I think we'll do desktop, mobile, and then server. So desktop, Ryzen 3 parts, four cores, four threads. What is there to be excited about that? Well, you know, I probably wouldn't have been as excited about them except for the Ryzen 1600 AF. If you've been living under a rock and you're not familiar with the 1600 AF situation. For deal hunters, deal hounds, bargain hunters, whatever you want to call yourself, the 1600 AF has been the killer deal for about the past six months, eight months, something like that. And you're thinking, wait, why is a first gen Ryzen, you know, why, why is that exciting? It's about $85 if you can find it. And it's a, uh, basically a Ryzen 2600 in disguise. So the rumor is that AMD ran out of 1600 dies from Global Foundries. So you, AMD sold all their silicon. It's like shareholders pay attention. Wow, I mean, they sold all the silicon. Remember the APU right down from a few years ago? That wasn't a good situation, but you know, here we are. It's like, okay, we're gonna have to rebadge our better silicon as a 1600 AF. Fortunately or unfortunately, depending on <laughs> whether or not you're a shareholder, uh, the 1600 AF is not available everywhere. Really, it's good for those like non-North American markets where disposable income is way less. And so we're talking about you know a high-end machine for some of those markets might have a hundred dollar CPU and a fifty or seventy-five dollar motherboard. They're really low-cost machines from the North American perspective. But that is another place where it's kind of flying under the radar a little bit, but AMD's totally changing the game. Cause that, you know, again, the 1600 AF processor was just a complete game changer there. And it's nice to see that the price point for one of the new Ryzen 3 CPUs is gonna be about $99, four cores, eight threads, which is, you know, Ryzen, it's like, <laughs> I mean, it's the, it's the low end, but it's the incredible value and in four cores for, Productivity and and basic stuff is you know it's fine. What kind of computer would you get? You know, an elderly relative, Ryzen three, probably an APU really, but Ryzen three maybe with a discrete graphics card. There might be reasons for getting a discrete graphics card. You might be doing a little bit of you know light something or an APU is just not gonna not gonna cut it. I don't know. But this announcement from AMD about Ryzen three uh, is is really pretty awesome. Let's talk about laptops. So AMD also launched a bunch of mobile CPUs. They're killing it. The battery life, you know, that was the thing that I was worried about. Killing it with battery life. Got a few designs. Uh, you know, it's it's apparent that AMD doesn't have the uh, army of nerds that, you know, Intel has enjoyed for the last decade. But gosh darn it, with the nerds they do have, they're doing an incredible job. Because, you know, Intel, I'm thinking about Computex at Intel. And the Computex keynote that Intel puts on, they're always like, look at these 73 models of laptop that are coming out. And AMD has a lot of models of laptop. But I think a lot of people are also cautious because if Intel responds with something really amazing out of, you know, out of the blue, then 
uh, you gotta figure that out. But look at the Surface. So like the Surface, um, the Microsoft Surface took a chance and used last gen's, one of uh, AMD's last gen um, Ryzen parts. And you could get the Intel version or you could get the AMD version. And rumor has it this is just down to supply issues. But there's articles that uh, don't really look favorably on the AMD version of those mobile CPUs. And those are technically last gen mobile CPUs, last gen Zen cores, I guess more accurately, I would say. Battery life, performance overall. Some things they perform well, but a lot of the kinds of things that you would be using a Surface for, they don't really perform all that well. So not a good look for AMD, but the other reason that you would do this, the other reason Microsoft would undertake this exercise is because they can see that the hardware that's coming down the pike is gonna be good. And because they already did all the work on the entire rest of the system, the display, keyboard, blah, 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 working out all the bugs, they're, they're gonna be able to drop in modern AMD CPUs into that surface line and it's gonna be golden. It's gonna be just amazing. And the new Ryzen laptops, they're just incredible. I mean, from Asus and, you know, Lenovo's got some models coming out and just every single one of them is just, you know, incredible, incredible features for the money. There are some weird things like GPUs. Like if you want a super high-end GPU, you can't really do it. And there's also some weird things around PCIe lanes like uh, PCI Express 3.0 by four or by eight for some things, depending on the laptop model. So AMD is still working on some stuff there. Probably they didn't do PCIe 4 for power management and power savings. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just, there are a lot of laptops that have, for example, an internal APU that has lots of PCIe connectivity to the CPU because it's all on one package. And then there's less PCIe connectivity to the entire rest of the system. So that's a little unusual, but that may just be down to, uh, you know, technically, you know, first generation products with this or adapting, you know, the old socket to the new socket. Not really sure, just speculation, just me jawboning. There's probably a good engineering reason for that, but uh, what you need to know is that <laughs> Andy's just killing it. I mean, even versus the, we're finally seeing 10th generation Intel mobile parts and they're not bad, but AMD, they're doing really well there. So what about Threadripper? Well, we're six months in with Threadripper, except for the 64 core, which is a little more recent. Threadripper is still just killing it. Like, it's it's just it's just dominating. And Intel has actually released new Xeon CPUs, new 31, uh, like I've got the 3175X, there's a 3275 Cascade Lake. I've been trying so hard to get my hands on a 3275 CPU to run it through the paces. I've got that really incredible EVGA SR3 Dark. It's a legendary motherboard. Socket 3647, six channels of memory. This is an incredible, incredible Intel system. I mean, I gotta admit, I've lusted after a system like that since I saw it at Computex. Again, this 2018 Computex, I, I was there. I was front row. I was right, I was in front of Linus. Linus was right behind me. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff there because we saw the, the 28 core running at five gigahertz uh, with three horsepower chiller. <coughs> yeah, so three, you know, more than, just a ridiculous amount of cooling, five gigahertz. I've been perfectly happy with like 4.3 or 4.4 gigahertz on my 3175X. And it's actually, you know, the, the the CPU actually came from one of our fans, Dizuri, and like he overclocked it and did a bunch of stuff to it. And then I traded him some stuff for it. And it's really, it's an incredible CPU because it doesn't have the hardware mitigations either. There's actually two steppings of the CPU, one with hardware mitigations and one without. Anyway, you should know like, how much I lusted after that, but it was just like, oh, I can't justify the cost of this. It's just so insane. And now Threadripper is a thing, and it's like, you know, um, Threadripper. It's like I could just get two Threadripper computers, and it's for everything that I have been using Threadripper for. Threadripper has been better, more cores, faster single thread, more memory, performance. Mostly, there's a couple things where having six channel memory really does help, but. On the EVGA SR3 Dark, it's I've got six slots versus eight on, you know, on like the 
the the Aorus Extreme motherboard, like the ridiculous builds that I've been doing. So AMD really is owning it here. But the important thing to take away is that AMD has actually been really busy making a lot of changes, not a lot of changes, but you know, kind of a lot of changes to the platform updates, improving device compatibility. And this is really like AMD and partners like Gigabyte working together to um, make more devices work. Uh, you know, bugs that I encountered on launch day were things like if I had a ton of NVMe devices in a machine, we're talking like six or eight, sometimes when I would boot, the devices would just sort of disappear one by one. That was down to a combination of UEFI version and a particular motherboard and the particular NVMEs that I was using. Things like the system won't boot if I've got a Tesla plugged in. It's like, well, that's the above 4G decoding. Now, most motherboards have more options for above 4G decoding. Things like uh, ridiculous NVMe performance, that's on the server side. AMD's still working on that one. Um, I'm in the loop on that and there are workarounds, like Dell has incorporated a workaround in their UEFI that will let you prefer particular bus for IO. So if you're building a ridiculous storage system like Linus' storage system or like the one that we put together with, with a bunch of those Intel P4500 NVMe, you can do that and the processor will prioritize I.O. for that. So those are teething issues that didn't wash out with uh, Naples and Threadripper first and second generation, but they are washing out with third generation Threadripper. So it's an incredible platform for just a whole bunch of stuff. Things like SQL performance. If you graph SQL performance of like the Xeon like 2650, 2650 V1, 2650 V2, 2650 V3, well, 2650 and 2650 V1, same, same CPU, then V2, V3, V4. And then the switch to socket 3647, and then, you know, like the gold and platinum CPUs, the CPU cost goes up, the cost per core goes up a little bit, the clock speed comes down in that graph, but the uh, number of like SQL transactions serviced by a thread basically levels off and it just stays flat. And so whether you're buying a Xeon 2650 or 2650 V4, the performance per dollar did not really improve for Microsoft SQL Server for four generations of Xeon CPU. And that really, really frustrated a lot of system administrators, myself included. Now you could pack more cores in and get more performance that way, but the, the performance for a given thread didn't really change. and the price didn't really go down either. It stayed about the same. If anything, it went up because there were other like things that you would have to worry about. The DDR3 to DDR4 transition, that, I mean, and then the RAM prices, and it was not a good time for servers. But if you look at Epic Naples, Epic Rome, Threadripper a little bit, although most people that are running, you know, enterprise, they're not gonna run SQL Server on Threadripper. Maybe for testing and dev, but not production. There's gonna be a comment below. Um, it looks like an exponential curve, again, like it should, like it's not leveling off. So there are a lot of people that are getting in test systems that are based on, uh, uh, you know, Naples and Rome, but I think where AMD is gonna knock it out of the park is fourth generation, because AMD is moving so fast. We've got Epic Rome, and we're going to see Ryzen 4000 soon, probably, maybe, possibly. I don't know. But Epic Rome is already knocking it out of the park. And unified cache and some of the other features that are coming, we're gonna see it in the supercomputers, if nothing else. Those features, the enterprise still wants those. Even though everybody's work from home, they really want those features. So it's really just, you know, what a time to be alive in servers. To bring that back to the Ryzen 3 launches, it looks like, we don't know yet, haven't tested it, but it looks like the performance of this CPU, if you look at the clock speed and you look at Zen 2's performance, it looks like these <laughs> Ryzen 3 CPUs are gonna be up on about the same performance as like an Intel 7700K. Four cores, eight threads. CPU launched in January of 2017, it was about $350. And now we're at a part where it's like 99 or $130, somewhere in that neighborhood. 
because I mean the 1600 AF is close. It's so close, especially with a little bit of an overclock. That's so close. That is an incredible price drop in three years when you look at not you know the ecosystem with, without AMD. Now, like I said, Intel makes some great products. They make some innovative products. Computex 2018. We saw Intel Edison. That's an incredible innovative product. I loved Edison. Canned. Then we saw 5G and communications and all this stuff. Canned. We saw a lot of stuff at 2018 Computex. It was almost like a de-emphasis on computing. I remember commenting another time. It was like, you know, Intel is all about computing and really amazing computing. And it seems like they've, they've, they're throwing in the towel because Computex was not really about computing except we had the, the 28 core but you know almost immediately people were like wait a minute you used a chiller and so immediately all of the wind in the sails of computing has been taken out and i don't know that the wind has returned in the intervening time i mean i really like the 3175x system but it uses like 700 watts of electricity at idle and my 32 core threadripper system uses like 130 watts at idle and most of that i think is the gpu so <laughs> i mean the Threadripper system has just been an utter joy to compute on. Couple rough edges. Certainly, AMD does not have the qualification budget of Intel, but I'm willing to put up with some headache here because of the, the pain that I've endured in past years. But I am looking forward to what Intel's coming up with because Intel has a lot of money and they're going to spend a lot of money. And they're waking up and they're hiring and they're doing a lot of stuff. So I think this is a really exciting time. Now, at the beginning of the video, I mentioned, sorry, I mean, I'm just giving you some background. I'm getting a little rambly here. At the beginning of the video, I mentioned that AMD has unwittingly made it easier for competitors. Cavium Thunder X3, that's a thing. Came out about a month ago, I think, give or take. A month, a month ago, six weeks, something like that. Cavium, the Cavium Thunder X2 system that I reviewed was an incredible system for Linux. So with, if you we put a little elbow grease into it, optimize it, do some compiling, you know, you have a system administrator that knows what they're doing and understands your business and can make some tweaks, which admittedly is not super common. But if you have that, a Cavium Thunder X2 system was an incredible system to work with. Just incredible for the price point performance, the connectivity that it offered, just really nice. Because everybody is retooling from a pure Intel ecosystem to an AMD, you know, supported ecosystem, there's a lot of changes to the Linux kernel. AMD's bringing a lot of new technologies like encrypted virtual machines and, you know, things like process scheduling and chiplets and oh, operating system architecture is factoring in here. And so the, uh, <laughs> the code paths in the wetware, the code paths in the people, in other words, the developers, that have to work on this didn't have to do nearly as much work on these parts of the operating systems before AMD came along because we just didn't have the hardware. Uh, unlike my 3175X system, even though it's a single piece of silicon, because of the physical distance between the memory controllers, you can actually run it as non-uniform memory access for a latency benefit. It's called subnuma clustering. It's a whole other thing. Like you didn't even know until I told you about that probably, right? I mean. Some of you did, but it's fine. So there's a whole lot of computer science that goes into this. And so those code paths in the wetware, as long as those people are working on the kernel and the operating systems, uh, are going to be handy for competitors of both Intel and AMD. People like ARM, and ARM is awake, and ARM, ARM and other reduced instruction set CPUs are coming. I don't know if it's gonna be the Cavium Thunder X4. I don't know if it's gonna be Nuvia. I don't know what it's going to be, Risk v I mean, Risk v is doing some incredible things in the space that they're working in. It's gonna be a while before they get to density servers. But because people have been making optimizations for the AMD platform, it is going to be easier to find talent, somewhat, I think, and people are going to be more used to modifying the software to suit the hardware. I mean, I know you have the source code, but it's not just a matter of recompiling. There's also compiler optimizations. There's also bugs in the compiler optimization. It's turtles all the way down. So you've got to have people that are used to making those kinds of modifications and also doing that kind of debugging, which is hard to do. But we've got the computational resources to do it. And we've also got the experiential resources in the engineers that are doing it. 
So I hope that AMD's victory is long lived here, but we could see, we could actually see an era where new compute platforms uh, come to the surface and or become more popular than they've been able to in the past because, hey, I've got x86 on my desktop, I want x86 on the server. It may be so easy to hop platforms because of good support for the operating system and everything else that that will be less of a thing in the future. Don't know. So what would I like to see? You might be thinking. Well, one thing I would like to see is an HBM2 laptop. I mean, it sounds crazy, but low power HBM2, putting the memory as close as possible to the CPU, about 16 gigabytes of it. Hey, if we can have tiered memory access where I've got you know another 16 gigabytes of memory somewhere else, eight threads and a laptop, low power, that'd probably be an incredible, incredible laptop. I hope somebody has built a prototype of something like that somewhere, even if it uses a ridiculous amount of power, just to experience if the compute capabilities of that are completely insane. And I know what you're thinking, consoles. That sounds like a console. Eh, GDDR6 and eh, I don't know. That's going to be a story for another day. I'm Wendell. This has been a level one ramble. I'm signing out. You can find me in the forums at level one text, forum.level1text.com. I'm Wendell. I'm signing out and I'll see you there. And thanks for hanging out and stay safe and get plenty of food and do the grocery online pickup thing. See you later.